Hey folks, I'm Alex Dowd. And I'm Katie Rife. A few weeks before Halloween every year, Austin, Texas plays home to Fantastic Fest, maybe the most prominent genre-centric film festival in America. On a brand new episode of the show, Katie and I discuss this annual destination event for lovers of the weird, the scary, and the extreme. And we'll get into three of the more prominent selections of this year's edition. Welcome to Film Club. Okay, folks, thanks again for joining us for another episode of Film Club. Um, uh, at the top of the hour, I guess I'll say, uh, we, we, we have lied to you again. Um, <laughs> last week in, 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 in the outro of the show, we promised that we would be talking about the man, the legend, Nicolas Cage. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're not doing that this week. Um, it's an evergreen topic. It really is. It really is. We'll get, we'll get to Cage eventually. We really will. <laughs> There's lots to discuss with Nicolas Cage. It's been an interesting year for him. but we, I have we, some punny pitches for titles for the episode do tell uh, yeah. maybe we don't want to ruin them <laughs> yeah we'll save it <laughs> save them you know what i'll tell you what the week that we do it you can um we'll we'll give the title and then you can also tell people your, your alternate ones <laughs> just make that a we whole didn't list, use yeah. run down all the rejected that's actually titles. all the episode will be is just making puns on nicholas <laughs> oh, cage's name, name. Cage. <laughs> Um, In any case, we're not talking about Nicolas Cage this week. Sorry about that. But we are talking about a festival that has hosted some Nicolas Cage movies. This is true. And Nicolas Cage himself, I believe, has shown up. Ooh. Yeah, this this festival, it's Fantastic Fest in Austin, Texas. Uh, you heard the intro. So you did no hear the intro. Spoiler yeah. <laughs> there. Uh, yeah, Fantastic Fest is going on this week in Austin. Um, I uh, made the decision not to go this year, and I am feeling a little salty about it. <laughs> Are you feeling a little festival FOMO? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, Uh, So Fantastic Fest, if you're not familiar with it, it is the largest genre festival in North America. It started in 2005, and um, Fantastic Fest is very closely tied to the Alamo Draft House um, in terms of like branding and content and just the way that it's presented. Uh, So it it, um, started in 05 and kind of grew out of back in the early 2000s, the Alamo Draft House became known for these 24-hour film festivals, right? They had one called But Numathon that was sponsored by... Ain't It Cool News? It was a different era. We'll talk about that later. Um, And then they also had QT Fest, which was a 24-hour marathon that Quentin Tarantino used to program for the uh, for the draft house and fantastic fest kind of grew out of that you know that those those um those events kind of bolstered the alamo's reputation among filmmakers and they parlayed that into a film festival and in alamo style it started out very stunty (laughs) very and Mm -hmm. it's still kind of stunty (laughs) kind of william (laughs) castley yeah they like to do um (laughs) They like to do costumes. They like to do. Uh, they had. There's a marching band called Itchy O that's based in Denver that they fly down sometimes for the festival. And their whole shtick is that they're a satanic marching band. <laughs> and so they cool. hire they hire a satanic marching band to like walk through the lobby, you know, causing uh, chaos sometimes. And uh, so the unofficial mascot of Fan- <laughs> Fantastic Fest came from a screening of Antichrist. I feel like this tells you a lot about like the audience and the um, and the type of films they play. The fox that goes chaos reigns. Yeah. They kind of adopted the fox as their mascot. <laughs> <laughs> Is that that's still the case? Uh, to a certain extent, they have a new mascot now. Well, the whole chaos reigns thing. Again, we'll talk about it. Things changed a few years ago a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, so, you know, uh, there was less emphasis on the chaos aspect of it. <laughs> yeah. The, so the festival has grown over the years, obviously. And yeah, quite a bit. That aspect is still a part of it, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, this year, maybe not so much because there are less people on, on well, the ground this year. they're still, they didn't have, they're known for, like, having big theme parties and stuff like that. They didn't do any of that this year. But, for example, last night, they had a secret screening of Benedetta, the new uh, Paul Verhoeven movie. Mm-hmm. And they had, you know, employees dress up like priests and nuns and bless people and wave incense around and, you know, <laughs> spit up blood in the theater and stuff. And it was very odd because, you know, this year it's a COVID edition. And so everyone's like spaced out. And so it's this like half full room, you know, where there's like three <laughs> people in a row. And then you have like people in nun costumes, you know. <laughs> Just <laughs> like, trying to keep the spirit of the fest up. Yeah, even though there's- totally. Much fewer people there. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a much smaller edition than usual this year. Um, but yeah, to so oh, basically over the course of the 2000s, you know, the festival grew and grew and grew, and it became known as a really like fun time. But also, it's uh, 
reputation for programming grew too. Um, it's they've hosted some prominent world premieres, like Zombieland world premiered there, uh, Troll Hunter world premiered there, Bone Tomahawk world premiered there. They become known for that, and they become known for having um, really good secret screenings. Like I saw a uh, split. And Crimson Peak and Suspiria, all in secret screenings at Fantastic Fest. And I be- uh, Split was a complete surprise. Nobody knew that was coming. And I believe Crimson Peak and Suspiria were both North American premieres in the secret screening. So they're, they've been known really for that. And another thing that's interesting is over the years, um, I guess the identity of the festival has evolved where it used to be. And I think this reflects a change in film culture and in you know, like genre film culture over the past 15, 16 years, where at first it was very much just about like, you know, party movies and exploding heads and like weird, wacky shit, which is great. And they still have that. (laughs) But they've also kind of grown to expand the definition of genre into something that is, um, it incorporates, honestly, some, you know, more highbrow stuff. Like, for example, okay, so 2016 was a really good year for Fantastic Fest. I was at Fantastic Fest in 2016. It was a great year. They had a lot of a lot of really great titles. But here's an example of the range of stuff they show. They had Sadako versus Kayako, <laughs> the um, Ring Grudge crossover kind of direct-to-video Japanese horror movie. And they also played Tony Erdman. <laughs> <laughs> that being Marin Ed's uh, three-hour comedy drama Premiered at Cannes, very, very, a, a very highbrow selection. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a highbrow comedy, but yeah. So basically, um, you know, it started as a pretty straightforward like g- definition of genre as like horror, sci-fi, fantasy, action, and it's a kind of expanded over the years to include dramas with hints of like the supernatural or outrageous, and just basically non-mainstream comedies, quirky comedies, cringe comedies, art comedies, gross-out comedies, just anything that isn't kind of mainstream American comedy. They'll show at this festival as well. So it's not just, at this point, it is not just a destination to see um, the new Halloween film or something. You know? It is, but it's more than that. Right. You can catch up with some of your more um, uh, outre can selections there and TIFF selections there. You can catch up with uh, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah, for those who don't know, most film festivals, um, most of the major film festivals, um, are not particularly known for elements of audience participation. Um, <laughs> no. There's not a lot of themed aspects to the fest. You not you not go to Cannes or Toronto expecting to get um, people in. Like, like Benedetta, the, the movie you mentioned, premiered at Cannes, and um, I, I can tell you that there were the ushers were not in. None outfits. None outfits <laughs> again. So, but that's part of the appeal of the fest, right? Yeah, that's part of what's fun about it. Yeah, and it, and um, that's what kind of what the Alamo excels at is um, making these sorts of films. They're they're really big on like having a having a big tent, I guess you know, and like welcoming people in and making it like a fun experience, which I think is different from a lot of film festivals that are more elite. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. it, it they, they they try to be a little bit more populist. And one of the things I like about it, about the way they have been incorporating more films like Tony Erdman, is that they don't underestimate the intelligence of a so-called genre audience, which I appreciate. Totally. I mean, um, I, I, I've found over the years that cinephiles who, this is not universally true, but many cinephiles who are into sub- disreputable supposed low culture mm. are omnivorous, too. Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah. I mean, like, certain... some of the most hardcore horror fans I know could get into something like Tony Erdman. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In um, the film Border, which was pretty low mm-hmm. profile, but I really liked a lot. That's another film that played at Fantastic Fest. It's more of like a drama with shades of fantasy, mm-hmm. you know, and it is an art film. But, you know, it played there. Um Films like The Witch, I think part of this is like reflecting the culture also, you know, like films like The Witch were obviously big at Fantastic Fest. That's like, that's like a cornerstone title for something like Fantastic Fest is a film like The Witch or The Lighthouse, you know, Um, uh, you know, like Ari Aster, Robert Eggers, those types of directors all come out to it. Um, But other, I mean, they get directors from abroad too. One thing that one advantage that they have is they have the distributor connection through um, Alamo Drafthouse, which is now connected to Neon, which is a big distributor. Now they've come up in the world. um, You know, they distribute a portrait of a lady on fire and Parasite and big films like that. And so between that and the fact that they're situated between TIFF, New York Film Festival, and Beyond Fest in L.A., 
means that they get a lot of guests. Mm -hmm. Like even this year in the scaled down version where the audiences were smaller and there really were very few press on the ground in attendance, they still got Julie Ducourneau came, Edgar Wright came, Paul Verhoeven did a video intro, Dario Argento showed up, I guess, (laughs) in person. Um, (laughs) To a room full of 20 people. Yeah, so so they're keeping the guest aspect of it going um, even in the smaller scale. But yeah, they, they're really known for kind of drop-ins like that of, of big names and being more accessible. Like um, the year that Halloween played there in 2018, Jamie Lee Curtis was there. And I have a hilarious picture of some of my, you know, you when you go to a fest for years and years, you have like your festival friends. I have a hilarious picture of two of my festival friends, two guys who grew up, you know, watching Halloween. And Jamie Lee Curtis just like walks up to him and is like, hi. And, I, and the look on their faces is like, <laughs> like <laughs> they can't make a sentence because Jamie Lee Curtis is standing right there. Was it like that video where Beyonce comes up behind Chance? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that video. By the way, that is like very wholesome. Just how excited he is to see. Anyway, I'm derailing this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, is there at Fantastic Fest? Is there more interaction between the guests and? people in the audience? They're definitely a lot more accessible. Um, like, for example, you know, I mean, they they don't all hang out at the bar, but some of them do. Mm-hmm. Like, um, some sometimes uh, pretty big name filmmakers will come and just hang out at the bar, and if you want to go talk to them, you can. That's exciting. And I, I think it's interesting, and it has a lot to do with their community. Um, like, for example, Elijah Wood goes most years, and everybody kind of knows not to bother him, and they have a no autographs policy. Oh, that's great. Yeah, there's a no autographs policy there, and just basically they're like, everybody be cool. Like, we think these people are great too, but like, they're just people and they just want to hang out and watch movies and have a drink or whatever. And so, for the most part, people respect that. And so, it does create a really kind of unique atmosphere. That's cool. Um, I, I feel like I should, I, I wanted to mention that I, I feel like part of, I I wonder, I guess I'll ask you this. Do you think, how much do you think Fantastic Fest embracing stuff that doesn't fall in traditional genre categories, how much do you think that is, that is related to the way that horror itself has been embraced in recent years by the critical community, how there is, uh, maybe, maybe horror in general is considered less disreputable than it was at a certain point? Honestly, I think it was like a critical factor in it. I think that when the story of that particular rise is told, there's going to be a few factors. And I think Fantastic Fest is going to be one of them. As the fortunes of the festival has risen and, you know, they've started diversifying their programming, like you said. I mean, it all happened at the same time or maybe a couple years before, you know, suddenly horror was respectable again. Like you started seeing more big name critics uh, going to the festival, going to Fantastic Fest. And, you know, around the same time, uh, the critical community at large started embracing horror more. So I think it was a factor in that, honestly. Yeah. How many years have you, have you been going at this point? Um, well, I went in 2011 and 2012, um, just on my own. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I went 2015 through 19 for AV Club. So five years. And I was on the jury in 2018. Got it. Uh, so you were obviously... You you were there when the festival sort of became uh, embroiled in some controversy. Yes, this was in 2017. This is why I was saying that they have had to um, make some changes in the sort of like anything goes freewheeling aspect of it Mm -hmm. because um, there was some issues where uh, Devin Faraci and Harry Knowles, two names of critics who – you know, some pretty serious allegations made against them in terms of like sexual harassment and assault. We're both working for Fantastic Fest. Um, and Fantastic Fest hired Farachi back after he was kind of drummed out of critical circles because of some assault charges. And so that became a big controversy with the festival. And um, and this was and again, this dovetails in with a larger issue also, because this was around the same time that the um, reconsideration of women in horror started to happen of like, how come no women direct horror movies, you know, and even like I've seen a huge difference 
in the number of women, in the number of queer people, and the number of people of color who attend Fantastic Fest, just in the like decade that I've been going off and on. Like it used to just be your stereotype of like white dudes and black t-shirts, sure. like <laughs> kind of stinky ones, more so, but now it's very different from that. And I think that was a conscious effort they made on their part. But yeah, 2017, um, was a year where I actually got a little bit involved where I hosted kind of a private meeting um, for uh, the women in the press corps so we could talk about this is basically our strategy because all this happened all this went down the week before the festival was supposed to start that the news leaked that like uh, Farachi was still quietly working for the draft house and then a bunch of allegations against Harry Knowles started to come out around the same time and some people that I knew were personally affected by this. And so, um, yeah, so I basically hosted a meeting with the press corps and we basically talked about what we were going to do. And we all kind of agreed that this festival had played a big part in the launching of our careers and some filmmakers came too. And we all agreed that it was basically part of, you know, our careers and that we weren't going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, but we weren't going to uncritically just cheerlead for this festival either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I basically uh, I, I've since passed it on to another person. But for a little while, I was part of a committee um, to discuss, you know, certain changes that were made. And they did they did shake it up. You know, they put in they put some women who had kind of been working behind the scenes, got promoted to leadership positions uh, in programming and in operation. And, um, yeah, they just started making more of an effort to be inclusive. Um, it's it's little things. Like, they didn't used to have tampon machines in the bathrooms, and now they do. Right. <laughs> just, like, considering <laughs> the needs of women. Sure. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, how, is it, uh, how is it reflected in the programming? Are you seeing more films by people who, who don't look like me, for example? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think that's a larger industry trend as well. I don't yeah. think that it's just this festival. I think that this festival is just very much caught up in those t- like big events, you know, because 2017 was also the year that the Harvey Weinstein allegations came out. Yeah, that it's, happened. It's, it's been a it's been yeah. a major sea change for the industry in some ways. Uh-huh. Although I, we could probably have a larger discussion about the way that. Some things probably haven't changed and still need to change. And yeah, I my concern now with you know the all the the Me Too of it all is that you know now that it's been about four years in a pandemic that everyone's going to kind of slide back into their old ways. That's my fear. I I, I yeah I, I think you could be right, and I think that also a lot of what has a lot of some, maybe at least some of the uh, seemingly positive changes that have been made in the industry have been about optics. I think mm-hmm. you know been about how are we presenting. How the way this industry looks, mm-hmm. and when I say industry, I mean I mean Hollywood, but I also mean the fest- festivals, festival circuits. I yeah. mean all, all aspects of the filmmaking ecosystem. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, all of them have experienced a reckoning, mm-hmm. and uh, I I hope that there there's genuine institutional changes happening within those circles, as opposed to just. Um, just just an optical change. Right. I mean, they do have more women in leadership positions at Fantastic Fest than they used to. Um, so that has been a lasting change uh, over there. But yeah, like there really had to be a reckoning about this like freewheeling party hardy culture when it turned out that there was some, you know, women were getting touched at I mean, screenings, you know, yeah. like just things that weren't OK. I have to say I'm not terribly shocked that a festival that has cultivated a kind of uh, well, we all party and there's lots of drinking involved mm-hmm. constantly. That there have been problems with that. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, brief, brief pause on this fantastic fest discussion. I just wanted to mention a little, little peek behind the curtain. Uh, we are recording again in the AV Club office. Ooh. It's, uh, I personally have not been here in a year and a half, so it's really interesting. <laughs> There's so um, much mail to go through. <laughs> There's a lot of mail on our desks. Um, but it's 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 cool to be back. It's also cool to have a a, a very professional setup that we're working mm-hmm. with today. Um, we've been kind of uh, – there's a, there's a certain – bootleg aspect to the recording of Film Club in the past. You know, we've <laughs> rolled with the punches. We, um, I mean, it really, I mean. All respect to everybody who who helps uh, our producer, Carl, and everybody who helps put on uh, hey, Film Carl. Club. And, you know, I think we've we've come up some, with some really great solutions. I mean, even transitioning into a, a podcast. A podcast was, an, uh, was a move dictated by necessity, it really. Was, it was. Yeah. Uh, necessity being the mother of invention in this case. Exactly. This, pod, this was not a podcast before the, the pandemic. It was entirely a video <laughs> show. It became a podcast because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to turn this into a lot of back padding of how great a job we do. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mostly just wanted to mention that it's interesting to be to be doing this um, in a new setting and and to uh, have this um, fancy little setup we got. I really <laughs> like that. So, um, um, but I just want to put a button on what we were just talking about and say that yeah, like it's not a surprise that given the kind of culture of the festival that a reckoning had to happen. But I will say that you know from doing a little bit of behind the scenes work on that, I do think that they were. Uh, earnest in their um, desire to make structural changes. And it's still a fun festival. You know, it sure. hasn't, it's still fun. And their whole thing is about kind of like being, like I said, you know, filmmakers mingling with regular folks and stuff like that. So one can hope that it could be fun and safe. Yeah. And yeah. a healthy environment That's where you can goal. still have a good time. That's <laughs> the goal. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that other festivals, one of the things I've noticed at other festivals is that uh, there has been the uh, addition of a hotline. That they've mm-hmm. added. I'm not sure if that's something Fantastic Fest has done well, yet. Well, what Fantastic Fest has done, well, because it's at an Alamo Draft House, and if you've never been to an Alamo Draft House, they have a food and beverage service during mm-hmm. the movie. Um, Fantastic Fest has uh, started a system where um, you can flag, like because you, you put up a little card and write down what you want on it, you can flag your server if someone's bothering you and they'll get their badge taken away. And they have taken people's badges away for it. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah. What I've seen is a sort of if you see something, say something policy, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is a, a positive development. But they do. They do. And I mean, that wasn't like talk. I People did get their badges taken away for being, you know, out of pocket <laughs> and how to speak to people. Sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about this year's edition. Mm-hmm. Um, you are not on the ground there, obviously. No, right, Santa. <laughs> the AV Club has covered uh, every film festival this year virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, we hope to be back in person next year at a festival oh, because oh. really a, a festival is not the same virtually and beyond the issues of access that I've uh, bitched way too much about um, <laughs> on the site and on this podcast. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, it's just a different experience when you're there in mm-hmm. person. And, um, you know, we don't know what the future is going to hold. We don't know what the next year is going to look like in terms of where we're at with the pandemic. I hope that we're back in person. Mm-hmm. But um, this year you have seen some of the films that uh, that going into the festival because you, had, you, you, you attended Fantasia Fest. Yeah. Or I, virtually anyway. Yeah, I kind of ride the... You ride the, like, mainstream circuit and I ride the genre circuit right. is how it's kind of worked <laughs> out in the past. But, totally. you know, um, I've covered TIFF these past couple years also. Yeah, and between, like, Fantasia and TIFF and if, you know, we had gone to Con, that's kind of where they pull a lot of their stuff from. And then the, a lot of the world premieres are more, you know, things that are produced by Fangoria, for example. Fangoria mm-hmm. Studios, those type of titles will still world premiere a fantastic fest. And yeah, it's the secret screenings are really the good stuff there. Like that's <laughs> the, yeah. this year it was uh, One Night in Soho and Benedetta, like I said. So that's, we're very that's excited to see both of those. That's the good stuff. <laughs> uh, well, we're going to talk about three of the films of this year uh, at this yeah, year's edition. Yeah, including an award winner. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, all of these are films that premiered at other festivals mm-hmm. uh, and are kind of doing a victory lap in Austin. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's start with what I would say is probably the most uh, – probably the, the most acclaimed on the art house circuit of the films in this year's lineup, and that would be Titan. Mm-hmm. And that is the new film from uh, Julia uh, Ducarneau. Yeah. Uh, she's a French filmmaker, and she, her debut a few years ago was this film called Raw, mm-hmm. and you actually saw that at Fantastic Fest, is yeah, that right? I did, and Raw was an, an interesting example of kind of the power of Fantastic Fest, I suppose, to where Raw premiered at Cannes, but it was a market screening, and it was not very buzzy or well attended, <laughs> and then it played at Fantastic Fest and just, phew, like, yeah. kind of took off from there. And uh, yeah, I was. This is a really great uh, memory of me as a film critic. I'm like walking up to the draft house, you know, whatever. It's all in the same space too, which is another thing that makes Fantastic Fest different from other festivals. Mm-hmm. Is that usually they spread it out this year for spacing purposes, you know, COVID protocol. But normally it's all in the same theater, which is actually really awesome. You don't have to like run from place to place. It's super convenient. It's super convenient. And they have a press room there. So you can just like go to a screening, do your type, 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 type. Right, right. And then run to another screening without having to run all over town, which is just fabulous. Because, yeah, like Sundance in Toronto, for example – those uh, all the screenings. I mean, it's, the press and industry screenings in, in, at TIFF, for example, are held in one place. They're mm-hmm. held in one AMC with a very long escalator to get up there. But <laughs> <laughs> the people always talking; those are always breaking down. But um, 
those in terms of, particularly if you're going just as a, a member of the public, mm-hmm. you're racing all over town to different venues. There's multiple theaters that you're going to. Mm-hmm. Um, Sundance has a shuttle system. I, I can imagine it's very convenient to just be like, this is where are there multiple theaters? It's yeah, the it, it, house, right? yeah, it's it's like the flagship draft house in Austin, the South Lamar, mm. and it's a multiplex. So I think they have what like eight screens in there, and some of them are pretty small, but some of them are you know decent sized auditoriums. Cool. They hold a few hundred. Um, so back to Titan. I don't know if, how many of our listeners saw Raw. It was a uh, a film about a young girl who discovers that she has uh, cannibalistic urges. She's mm-hmm. going to college. Her older sister is already there, and it's um, you know, the story about sisters and also about uh, kind of using cannibalism as a metaphor for the discovery of the forbidden fruits of mm-hmm. college. You know, becoming mm-hmm. becoming who you are and realizing that you have desires beyond childhood. Um, that film sort of gained some some pre release notoriety for. Uh, at festival screenings, uh, a couple people got sick or... Can I give my opinion about this? I think this is all ballyhoo. I think that the reason that people faint yeah. at uh, Sundance is because it's a high elevation and they've been drinking all day. <laughs> I think that <laughs> I think that the people reason people boo at con is because they're French. Like, I don't <laughs> think that it really reflects, like, extreme content, really. But well, I feel don't like listen the- to me. I watch movies where heads blow up for fun. So, like... <laughs> well, yeah, so I will say that, though. But So you look at something like Raw. You and I can see something like Raw and we think, like... <laughs> Yeah, what's what's the big fuss? It's not that uh-huh. gross. But the thing about Raw was that Raw sort of um, it it in terms of how it was released in the audiences that were seeing it in some places, it was among it, it, art house audiences were watching it. Mm-hmm. It was not it was not going immediately in front of just the midnight crowd. One might that's say. true. And Fantastic Fest is like kind of the ultimate midnight crowd. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So if if you I, I'm imagining like years ago I worked at a landmark. I'm imagining like the landmark crowd going to see Raw. They're going to see some shit in that movie, which is critically acclaimed and seems like a, an art house movie. They're going to see <laughs> some shit in that they don't normally see in a <laughs> movie. You know, it is it does have some gross moments for sure. That's true. There's a couple uh, gasp worthy scenes. Yeah. In it. But hang on to finish my thought from before. I'm walking up to the draft house. You know, it's like early in the morning. We're going to go see a press screening. And this woman, you know, this uh, publicist with a tote bag, like literally comes running up to me. And she was like, are you Katie Rife? And I was like, uh, yes. And she was like, oh, OK, I'm wrapping this movie. And I really think you should go see it because I really think you're going to like it. And I was like, OK. And it was raw. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a fun. That was a fun time for me. I got to feel famous for like half a second. <laughs> so Titan is her follow up to Raw, and uh, it premiered again in the Palais at at, at Cannes this year, mm-hmm. and it, it ended up winning the Palme d'Or, the top prize. That's wild. I mean, because it really is like a five year trajectory from the market to the Palme d'Or, which is huge yeah. leap. Yep. <laughs> and not the sort of film that honestly often wins the Palme d'Or either. Yeah. I mean, genre movies occasionally win but it's 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 very infrequent and mm-hmm. uh, this year Spike Lee was head of the competition jury yeah, I li- do you think I, he was being a little mischievous with all this I, I think so I also think that that Lee is somebody who throughout his career has um, occasionally taken on the role of provocateur mm-hmm. and I think he probably recognized a film that might be a kindred spirit in that respect that's that fair yeah. it's, it's a movie that gets people shook up I mean <laughs> his own masterpiece <laughs> Do the Right Thing premiered at Cannes mm-hmm. in, in, in 1989 and that was a film that got audience is really worked up and Titan um, I think is going to get some I think if the same audience that went and barfed at at Raw goes to see <laughs> Titan I think they're going to barf again because Raw <laughs> is a conventional film compared to, to <laughs> Titan I think yeah I think that's how you say it in French Titan um, because yeah like that it, that one has a f- like it has some outre content but it has a fairly uh, standard linear narrative and this film isn't really like that yeah I mean <laughs> if you I mean if, if you kind of it's obviously it's not a film that jumps around in time or anything but it is a movie where I feel like the uh, the psychology of the film is mm-hmm. rather inscrutable it is and uh, it's it's a very unpredictable film in terms of where it goes mm-hmm. um, I I, I felt watching it that I was playing a game of what movie am I watching, mm. um, which is always fun, uh, where you just have no idea minute to minute exactly what's going to happen in this mm-hmm. film. It, it takes, I would say it, it takes a good half an hour for this to even settle into what it's going to be about. Yes. And what's interesting about that is some of the... 
Well, I'm, I would say that some of the more outre, like um, Euro shock, you know, that's like a certain type of movie is a shocking European art film. That'd be French as well. French sort of, in particular. It fits sort of neatly into the, the French extreme movement. Yeah, like the first half an hour of this movie definitely does. But yeah. then it takes a turn into something that is more surreal and like kind of sweet, but in a very inscrutable kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to reveal – there's something very strange that happens in this film, and I know that probably a lot of people who have heard of this movie already know what that is. Yeah. I'm inclined this not to say it. Yeah. The, I I kind of wouldn't talk about the con- – it's going to be tough writing a review of this movie because I just don't feel like you really should talk about the content of it that much. Let's give a very basic okay. <laughs> sense of what the plot is. It's, it's, it's about a young girl who um, – in the opening scene, she she basically is in a car accident, mm-hmm. and she gets a uh, a plate in her head. She gets a metal plate in her head. Um, so the the film then jumps to her as an adult, and she is uh, kind of an exotic dancer. Who yeah. is this a real thing, by the way? Oh yeah, car shows are a thing. Yeah, but do they have that? Oh aspect yeah, they of, have. Okay, I know people who have modeled at car shows. Okay, yeah, it's right. a total thing. So she's a model who basically dances at car shows, mm-hmm. and there's an impression very early on that the accident was a formative experience for her mm-hmm. as a child. And <laughs> yes, in a, this is, this is a, film a primal about, kind of way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a film about a lot of things. I think one of the things it's about is the way that um, our sexual desires are mm-hmm. set in childhood, sometimes mm-hmm. by major events and sometimes mm-hmm. in ways that we don't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, it becomes clear very early on that this is a person who um, has some damage, Yeah, one might say. Yeah, one might say. Uh, again, I don't want to say exactly what, what happens from there mm-hmm. totally, but I'll say that um, the movie – keeps playing interesting games of identification and sympathy to what degree do we sympathize with this character. Something happens very early on that seems like it could be um, self-defense. Mm-hmm. And then the movie complicates that. Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, uh, again, it, some some things ha- some complications that I was not anticipating happen from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vincent Linden, the, the French actor, uh, a, a can regular, uh, shows up at a certain point uh, playing a father who has lost his lost his child years earlier, his son years earlier. Mm-hmm. And these two stories sort of intersect in a very surprising and interesting way. Yeah. And he uh, is the chief at a firehouse, mm-hmm. which is full of, you know, like w- one thing I thought was interesting about this film is um, there's a scene in Raw that's a party scene. And the way and she like films everyone's bodies moving in this really sensual way. But she but but that was like, you know, uh Different genders. But this one, she has all these shots of just like muscular young men, Mm -hmm. like, you know, like jumping up and down and dancing and throwing beer around. And it's very like erotic (laughs) the way she films it. It's very beau travail is what it is, honestly. Yeah, totally. I see a lot of Claire Denis in her, honestly. I I think, I I don't know if she's spoken of her her influences, but I think I could totally see that. Yeah, because I mean, I think think Raw was honest. I joked that it was trouble every semester. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it was basically uh, Denise film trouble every day, but in a college setting. Uh, and I, I don't know. Like, I think honestly, for all the, like their bizarre content, I think her films are a little more accessible than Denise in terms of storytelling. I think they are. I mean, Denise is very into um, to kind of scrambling. Uh, she'll often scramble the timeline. She'll mm-hmm. often a- a lead things like um, like basic expositional information. Mm -hmm. She sort of keeps the audience constantly racing to tell what's going on in her films, Mm -hmm. which I find exhilarating Mm -hmm. um, almost always. No, I do too. I like Claire Denis. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, I I would not suggest that uh, Ducarneau is is in her league yet necessarily, but Mm. I see a strong influence uh, Mm. of her. I I think she's a little more interesting. Claire Denis crossed with David Cronenberg. Yeah. There there, there is an element of body horror in this film. It's another thing that I don't want to talk too much about. It is um, pretty shocking. Yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Um, pretty, pretty gross, some of it. Uh, some of it's pretty gross, for sure. Yeah. It's very vaginal. Yeah, it is. Um, I haven't, I have not totally made up my mind about this film, honestly. Mm. And I think it's, I think it's an awesome choice for the palm, even, I mean, I, I don't know what I would pick because I haven't seen most of the films that it was up against in competition. I think it's a really interesting choice. It's, I think it's cool to see something that's not particularly Tony, that's mm-hmm. actually very, um, Raw, one might say. <laughs> but <I'm... laughs> yeah, I can just see sort of Spike like cackling as he. That's what I mean when I said he was being a little bit mischievous. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's a he's a bomb thrower sometimes. You know? um, yeah, he is in his films, and, and I think this one is a bomb, but it's like a French art bomb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where, did you find yourself getting emotionally involved in this one? 
Not so much. Like I would say that the uh, like I liked this film, but I wasn't in love with it mm -hmm. as much because I did find that her choice to make a lot of the motivations really and decision making really inscrutable kind of was at odds with the emotional tone she was going for in the second half. Yeah, I, I will say that. Um, and this is actually kind of a. Um, this is a through line for at least a couple of the films we're talking about today. I, I'm not sure this thing totally stuck the landing for mm -hmm. me. Um, I'm, I, I guess I, I'm fine on some level with on inscrutable an, psychology. On an, I think on an imagery level it stuck the landing, but I'm yeah. not sure it did on a storytelling level. Right. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm not sure exactly what my takeaway is supposed to be in terms of how. I mean, I'm fine with not, also not knowing how to feel about a character, yeah. but, but I'm not sure exactly how I feel about what this movie is trying to say about anything. Mm -hmm. But it works as a shock delivery. It works as a shock delivery. I think it's more of an open-ended question than a statement. I feel like this is kind of working through some things about, you know, um, about gender. I think it, there's some really interesting stuff about gender in this mm -hmm. movie and like gender is like a prison, you know, and trying to escape the prison of gender. Um, I would love to hear like kind of a trans take on Teton, which is mm -hmm. something I haven't heard yet, which hopefully will happen when it comes out uh, at the end of the week. When it, you know more audiences yeah. get to see it, yeah, there's there's definitely an element of that again, yeah. tiptoeing around what this film becomes. But. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, th that's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I think this film is more just working through some ideas than it is making a really um, you know powerful statement, which is why I don't think that it's like a masterpiece per se. But I do think it's a strong work from a filmmaker who is going to make a masterpiece one of these days. Yeah. Um, for those who want to hear more of Katie's thoughts on Titan, uh, her full review is up on the website now. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about a film that's shocking in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, shocking mostly for just the extremity of its violence. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a film that you saw at Fantastic, or sorry, a Fantasia Fest mm -hmm. this, this summer, and uh, that sort of came, sort of entered the festival with a wave of buzz on its back. That this was something that was. That this um, was like the most disgusting film that anybody had ever seen. Yeah. Which, it's not. It's pretty high up there. There's a few things in it that are pretty extreme. It's not. Um, have you seen very many Hong Kong Category Three movies from like the 80s and 90s? I haven't. I get, that's a blind spot for me. Okay, so um, back in the 80s and 90s, there was this thing called Category Three, which was basically an X rating in Hong Kong, and um, this was when the Hong Kong film industry was really thriving. And uh, so that there was like this category of movie that was basically just like shock horror. Um, and they were really, really extreme violence. There's one called uh, Ebola Syndrome that is like the most reprehensible movie I've ever seen. Wow. And that one has a lot of rape in it, which is why and it's very like uh, glib and glib about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so like I actually didn't much like that one. Yeah. Um, and this movie is sort of a modern update on Category 3. Got it. Okay. It's so it's a Ty, it's a Taiwanese. I guess you could call it a zombie movie in its own way. It's a zombie movie, sure. The, the, the Twenty Eight Days Later variety. <laughs> yes, they're you know? fast. Um, yeah, they're fast, <laughs> and also um, actually one of the scarier things about it that this is a this is a trend that I really like and that I find personally kind of scary is uh, zombie movies where uh, or I guess they could be vampire films as well. Uh, mm. Basically, where the thing that changes the person that. Uh, doesn't turn them into a mindless killing machine. Yes. They retain their personality. Yeah. The, this film's really interesting in the sense that, yeah, the the virus that infects everybody and turns them into essentially zombies in behavior, they're not dead. They, they're still alive and they can think. You know, yeah. they, they can speak and think and are humans, but they're just humans with no... Basically, their upper brain that keeps you from being a complete, you know, depraved monster, animalistic depraved monster, yeah. like basically that part of the brain shuts off. It's basically a psycho virus. I mean, yeah. it turns everybody into homicidal killers. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. yeah. Um, which is a scary idea and also one that I think speaks on, on some abstract level to the feeling that a lot of people have had lately that the world is just completely going mad. Yeah, just completely off its bearings. I, I did not know that this was a COVID movie when I saw it. Yeah. And I just had to laugh because, you know, there's so many movies about COVID and this movie kind of is like it 
opens with, you know, you have this young couple sort of stock horror movie characters at the beginning of the movie. Like they have a little bit of an argument and they kind of go about their day. And part of them going about their day is the guy is watching TV or he's watching a YouTube video on his phone. Sorry. And in the YouTube video, it's like a scientist arguing with some pundit about yeah. whether this virus is real. Right. And but I was dogs. like, oh, my God. <laughs> now, was the, so this was shot during COVID. It was. Apparently, um, they were kind of loosey goosey about it. That's Taiwan. very clear <laughs> watching the movie because there yeah. are tons of extras in this film. Yeah. Um, this is not, we've talked recently about COVID cinema on, on the podcast, and we often discuss the fact that you can often tell that something is a COVID movie because uh, the, there's certain tells. Yeah. It's, you know, it's very contained. There's often a, a small cast. Sometimes they're not in the same room. Yeah. You know? Or they're all outside. Or they're outside. Yeah. They're maintaining a distance of, mm-hmm. of six feet or something. Mm-hmm. This this movie, it's very clear watching it that it's it's engaging with COVID because of the scene you're talking about, it's very much about viral fears. Mm-hmm. But you would not guess it from the way it's shot. I mean, no. It, it seems like they – I mean, I kind of wonder, if, were there outbreaks on the set of this uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> sure. I have no idea. <laughs> but, you know, this movie does have sort of a transgressive aura about it. And yeah. uh, that contributes to it. For sure. Um, I, I, it's, it's, I, I feel like if Titan is an example of – Fantastic Fest, reaching for something that is uh, has a kind of higher pedigree that's a little more prestigious. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, it won the top prize at Cannes. The sadness to me feels like a down and dirty, typical midnight movie. Oh, 100%. Yeah, this is a movie that I think is exclusively for the midnight crowd. I don't think that like the crossover art house audience you were talking about would appreciate no. it at all. But it did win the best horror film award at uh, Fantastic Fest this year. Okay. They just announced it this morning. <laughs> I mean, it's very visceral. And um, I personally found it ultimately a little numbing. Mm-hmm. I think at a certain point when you are just bombarded with nonstop graphic violence. Yeah. And it, that doesn't offend my sensibilities. I'm not right. one who's that squeamish. I don't, I'm not like, oh. Yeah, it's important to draw a line between I was offended by this movie and, yeah, and it numbed me out. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it numbed me out at a certain point because, I mean, you have, within the first half an hour, you have people getting their eyes gouged out. Yeah. At a certain point, like, a you kind guy of, working at a coffee shop gets his head, gets, like, fryer oil poured yeah. on his head, so, and you see his face melting and yeah. all this stuff, yeah. Gross, intense stuff, but, like, at a certain point, if that, if you're getting nonstop doses of that, mm-hmm. you kind of just, it, it, your, your capacity to be shocked or horrified by it kind of goes down. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. And I think the the the... Raison d'etre of this movie is just shocking graphic violence. Yep. You know, that's what it's going for. Yep. And like I said, that's very in the spirit of Category 3. Totally. I think it does have a couple of ideas, though. Mm. And I think one of them, it, there, there's there's a really great early scene in the film where uh, you talked about the young couple that we meet. The woman in the couple, she's riding the train. And this is like right at the moment that everything, all hell is about to break mm-hmm. loose. And she's sitting next to this guy, and he's just this – he's this, like, kind of this middle-aged creep who's trying to, like, talk to her and and, and trying to, like, basically kind of creep on her, mm-hmm. hit on her. Oh, yeah. He's definitely harassing her. He's harassing train. her. Yeah. And she is basically like, leave me alone. Mm-hmm. And uh, his reaction is – I mean, he's he, he basically goes into what you might describe as an as a MRA rant. <laughs> a says, cancel culture rant? Yeah. yeah. He's like, you can't talk to anybody now. And um, from – after that moment, the, the whole – the train – Spoiler alert, the, the train erupts into horrific violence. Yeah, yeah, like seconds later. You, um, I think where their eyes turn red or something like that when they yeah. have the virus and somebody's eyes turn red and then all of a sudden it's like geysers of blood yes. yep. on this train. Just like uh, there's a shot uh, towards the end of the scene that you're talking about. There's a shot that reminds me of that famous shot in Near Dark. Mm. Uh, where there's the bar um, a massacre and then oh, Bill Paxton scene. standing there all soaked in blood yeah. with like this demented smile on his face. It reminded me of that. Yeah, totally. What I find interesting about that moment, though, is the implication that there's plenty of ordinary madness mm. in the world. That this guy, this guy, I think in that moment, the movie is suggesting that this guy could be capable of committing violence without this virus. I think yeah. he seems on the edge of, of hurting women without yeah. without a, 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 a rampaging virus. It is interesting that the virus in this movie doesn't make people do anything that they didn't already kind of want to do. Right, exactly. It's yeah. almost like the virus is, is basically giving them permission on some level to act on their impulses. Mm-hmm. And that's a scary idea because yeah. I actually feel like we are, as a culture, 
we are constantly facing that in in one respect or another. I mean, mm-hmm. when, when I don't want to get too political here, but when when you, when you have a, basically somebody on a national stage saying it's okay for you to feel the way that you feel, there are people you should hurt. There are people mm-hmm. who are less than you. I think this movie is tapping at least a little bit into that into that feeling that people are on the edge waiting for permission to go to commit violence. And you know what's really scary about that is the uh, the director, Rob Shabazz, he's Canadian, um, and this was shot in Taiwan. What's really scary is the idea that that's a worldwide phenomenon. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, <laughs> it's not it's, it connected to any one you know, country or leader, and that it's that the whole world is heading in this direction. Very much so. Yeah. So I, I ultimately, um, I, I think that this thing is is mostly just about bombarding you with horrible violence Mm -hmm. um and there's there's a pleasure to be had from that i guess if you want to call it a pleasure i mean yeah like it can be kind of fun to be like oh my god i think that this would be a fun fantastic fest movie Mm -hmm. because that kind of crowd like goes for this kind of stuff yeah would be howling yeah midnight screening of this movie (laughs) with the right crowd would be really fun but i would say that i don't think it's for general audiences oh definitely not not. (laughs) Uh, it it did it it reminded me of 28 days later in one Mm. other respect too in that that movie came out right on the cusp of SARS. Mm. Now, that was obviously a, a that was a pandemic that um, I mean that didn't become a pandemic really. That 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 was an outbreak that basically was got under control. But I remember reading a lot of contemporary reviews of Twenty Eight Days Later when it came out in, in two thousand two, and how much SARS came up in that, and mm-hmm. how it was tapping perhaps accidentally given the timing how it was tapping into some anxiety about that I think this one is deliberately tapping Very deliberately. into uh, COVID anxiety I think it is kind of a political film in the way that you're talking about mm-hmm. and I think it's a cynical film in the way that you're talking about because it does kind of say that most people are capable of horrifying violence given the slightest excuse yep <laughs> <laughs> okay let's uh, let's finally let's talk about another film that's showing at Fantastic Fest that I think is kind of touching into a uh, one could say zeitgeist anxieties. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Also very deliberately. Very deliberately, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is the new film by Jim Cummings, uh, The Beta Test. Mm-hmm. Now, Cummings is a uh, sort of a young American filmmaker. He's an actor, an actor, writer, director, triple mm-hmm. threat, and mm-hmm. somebody who uh, I'm really excited about as mm-hmm. this filmmaker. And um, he has built very quickly, I think he's built a very um, – thematically cohesive body of work. Yeah, and um um tonally consistent too, I yeah. think. I think I he's got a really like kind of singular a lot of people do, you know, riffs on different genres, but I think he does it in a very um singular way. For sure, yeah. Uh, he, he his his debut feature was this film called Thunder Road that I actually mm-hmm. saw at Cannes a few years ago. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where you see a movie and you 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 quite like it, you respond to it. There's some things about it that might bug you a little bit. You haven't totally figured out what you think about it, and then you finally see it a second time, mm. and you're like, "Holy shit!" Like it, the seeing it mm. the second time is a revelation. Mm-hmm. I think Thunder Road is a great film. I think it's it, it's it's a great. It's one of the great. I think he gives one of the great performances. There's of the last a really, decade. really good uh, monologue from him in that movie. Yes, <laughs> in the church. Yeah. yeah, the opening scene of the film is is this great piece of um, this great piece of acting. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's 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 an amazing tragicomic performance. Uh, he in that film he plays a uh, a Texas police officer who is. We'll say going through some shit. <laughs> that's sort of the. Um, that's a way to put it. Yeah. That's kind of what coming. It's does, not wrong. Though. I mean, all of his characters at this point have been that. I mean, he, I think as a filmmaker, he's very interested in men having meltdowns. Yeah, this one is a really interesting take on it, though, because. It is. Like when it first started, I wasn't sure where what he was really playing with, but by the end, I was like, "Oh shit, this is Jim Cummings' American Psycho." Kind of, yeah, yeah. Kind of. I also think it's very much a film that's about getting into the anxiety that some f- men feel about accountability. Mm. It's like, oh, that feeling that some men have now that they can't say anything, that they're <laughs> they're in danger of being canceled or something. Yeah, sure. But I, but it's not. But I think it's kind of satirizing that for through sure. the main character. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I, Cummings is. I think one of the things that's really interesting about his work, and one of the things that initially bothered me about Thunder Road was I was like, ah, are we really being asked to sympathize with you know this? This Texas police officer mm-hmm, with, a, mm-hmm. with a hair trigger temper, mm-hmm. somebody who can't control his emotions. And then, you know, I was being a fucking idiot and not just thinking the fact that Cummings is on some level is critiquing that, is saying that we live in a country where unstable men are being put in these positions and okay. given <laughs> guns, you know, <laughs> yeah. and allowed and allowed to police. And that's a regular thing. And I think this film 
walks that tricky that tricky tonal tightrope of of ask wanting us to on some level to sympathize with this guy but also satirizing him i mean it, we should mention too he is a in this movie he's playing a a hollywood agent mm-hmm. and um the character just kind of goes through a ringer of of humiliation a lot of it self-inflicted yeah if, if you've seen any of his other films uh, thunder road uh, and the one he made after it was called the wolf of snow hollow it sort of took a character who was pretty similar in some ways to the character in Thunder Road and put him into this small town, possibly supernatural murder mystery, Mm -hmm. you know, which Mm -hmm. is really one of the things I really like is that I feel like he's building this body of work of like, what if I insert a kind of type that I like to play into different genres, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Yeah. And um, yeah, I got a real late 90s, early 00s vibe from this Mm -hmm. one, which is right on time for, you know, the revival of that particular style of (laughs) genre horror filmmaking. I don't know if I would necessarily call this a horror movie. It's more of a thriller. This one kind of walks the line. It's got shades of like eyes wide shut in it too mm-hmm. it's a cringe comedy too mm-hmm. like all of his films yeah all totally of his films, I think, totally have aspects of cringe comedy to totally them. the premise is that um cummings uh, again again starring in his film uh, he plays a he's like a hollywood agent basically who uh he's getting married in in, in a couple weeks and he gets and his whole life is flop sweat <laughs> yeah his whole life is flop sweat <laughs> he uh he gets this he gets this mysterious uh this mysterious envelope in the mail and it basically is a card that says um, – it essentially says uh, you are invited to a one-night stand with a secret admirer mm-hmm. at this hotel. No strings attached, no names, masks, the whole thing. Exactly. Like a kind of thing that would be hard for a lot of people. And <laughs> to turn maybe down. particularly men for turn down, to turn down. <laughs> what are you saying, Katie? I don't – listen, I'm not going to – I'm not going to speak for men. <laughs> um <laughs> So the, yeah, the film sort of leaps off from him, uh, from from his decision making in terms of whether or not he's going to do this, and his uh, his general anxiety and paranoia about the whole thing, mm. and uh, his so one might say his uncontrollable impulses. It's partially about a, f- a film about somebody who is probably having some degree of anxiety about getting married as well. Yeah, um, and. Uh, the movie is like his other films is built entirely around his performance. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, did he sharpen his front teeth for this role? They really play up they his canine very, teeth in this role. <laughs> they, they do. I, yeah, I don't remember them looking like that in previous films, but it, it does become a plot point at a certain point where he says there's something going on with my teeth, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and he's always putting on these teeth whitening strips. <laughs> and yeah. They really play up his teeth. And um, yeah, I thought this movie was really interesting in the sense that it was also kind of about Hollywood in the sense and the larger and, you know, like kind of Me Too comes up here and there. But it's just little things where um, a couple times the character says, oh, well, now Harvey's gone and everything's fine. Right. And that's good. That's a big theme in the movie. Um, and it's kind of about someone who has never had to face consequences, who has just been bullshitting and, you know, scheming and scamming his whole life and has just kind of, you know, taken advantage of people and all this stuff, finally facing consequences or yeah. trying to get out of consequences for his actions. Yeah. I think he's having an identity crisis, too, on some mm. level and um, realizing the extent to which um, he bullshits his way through almost everything. Everything, <laughs> including his relationship with his fiance. Yeah. Yeah. Cummings she's is- kind of on to him. I yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, Cumming, Cummings is so good as an actor in playing. I mean, again, he, he's kind of developed a type to the point where I wonder how how many more of these he can do in this kind of general mode. Mm. Even though I think each one has been pretty satisfying in its own <laughs> right. But he kind of uh, he's developed this regular type that he likes to play of this guy who is very much on the edge, and is doing is doing his damnedest to stay off that line, mm-hmm. but is constantly stumbling over it. But this guy's a little different, I think, in that, I mean, when I said American Psycho, I think he's a Patrick Bateman type of character. Mm. I think he's a bit of a sociopath. I don't think that he really, I think his main concern is just getting out of consequences. For sure, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So it's sort of Patrick Bateman as bumbling detective for a lot of this movie. (laughs) We see him sweat a little bit more than Bateman. True, Uh, I don't think he's quite the psychopath that Bateman is. Okay. You know? But but I think you're right that there is, I, I had that thought too watching it, that there is a little bit of him in this this characterization as somebody who is um, just not connecting with other people. Yeah, very, it's very much the um, 
the <laughs> I kept thinking about it. Uh, him uh, in there's that scene in American Psycho where he's on the phone making a fake reservation for Dorcia. Yeah. Like that's that's the aspect of the character that's in this movie. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, had, I thought a little bit of Ben Stiller watching him. Oh, interesting. Reason. Okay. You know, he had a little bit of that gooniness uh-huh. you know, of like somebody who is um, who has gotten himself into a sticky situation and is trying to fumble his way out of it. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Yeah, it's definitely lampooning this type of guy. For sure. Yeah, he, he is Cummings is is fully willing to make himself the butt of the joke and to look embarrassing on screen. Mm-hmm. His characters are always having meltdowns, you know, yep. mm-hmm. <laughs> or always on the verge of one, you know, <laughs> and that that is a um, that is a comic gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. And seeing it in the context of like a Hollywood agent. And um, yeah, I thought it was so interesting the way they kept bringing up, you know, like, oh, well, the industry's changed. Everything's different now, yeah. you know, like, uh, the way that they treated, um, you know, like uh, the fact that Harvey Weinstein went to jail and now everything's fine. Right. And that's sort of of a piece with what you were saying about this guy who is desperately trying to keep it together and he's on the edge of falling apart. Yeah. And it's sort of like the industry in general is being drawn into that satire, I yeah. think. Okay, Katie. So those are three of the movies playing at Fantastic Fest. Um, is there anything else at the fest that you would recommend people check out? Either, I guess, virtually through there is a virtual component of Fantastic. There Fest. There is a virtual year. component of Fantastic Fest, and that is going to continue after the fest wraps. So we'll be hearing this on Friday, but all through the first weekend of October on Alamo on Demand, they're going to have uh, uh, Fantastic Fest movies on demand. Oh, nice. Okay. So uh, when you're listening to this, it's not too late to watch some of these movies. <laughs> That's great. So e- either either through that system or if you don't have time or they're not available then I think all of these movies will at some point um, see some sort of release yeah the ones that we're talking about I mean Titan is out this Friday uh, I imagine the beta test doesn't have a date schedule but I imagine that one will come out oh yeah I think so yeah. so um what are other titles that are playing the fest that you would recommend? Some other titles, um, you know, and these are ones that I saw, you know, at different fests along the way. There's a really charming little Japanese, like, 70-minute um, comedy called Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes that was a really, like, kind of fun, sweet take on uh, time travel. It's like this cafe owner finds out that the CCTV in his cafe is showing what's happening two minutes in the future. And so <laughs> it just kind of, like, proceeds from there. Um, and then there's a movie called Hellbender that's coming to Shutter next month. Mm. So you'll be able to watch it on there. And um, that is a really interesting take on like folk horror is kind of having a moment. And this is an interesting take on that. It's an interesting take on the witchcraft movie and on the coming of age movie that I thought was really interesting. It has a lot of like trippy imagery. Mm. But what I think is really exciting about that one is that it was created completely outside the system. Got it. It's this family, three people who live, I think, in upstate New York and New England anyway. And they just make movies on their own. They've made like 10. And, you know, true to the Robert Rodriguez School of Filmmaking, by the time you get to like the 10th movie, it's something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good by the 10th movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was one that I saw at TIFF um, that I really liked. Um, I don't know if this one's playing virtually, but it's definitely playing in Austin. Uh, it's called Saloom. It's like a... Um, uh, I'm not, sh- I think it was Senegalese uh, back. It definitely takes place in Senegal. And it's an interesting blend of like um, action, horror, and mystery with like really, really just like cool main characters. <laughs> okay. Like Hollywood action heroes wish they were as cool as these guys. This is one of your favorites at TIFF. Yeah, I liked that one. Cool. Yeah. You can catch a selection of films from Fantastic Fest past and present on Alamo On Demand. Uh, That is under the banner of FF at Home. And please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Film Club wherever you get your podcasts. This week's episode of Film Club was hosted by me, Alex Dowd, and by Katie Reif. Produced by Carl Blomberg. Our sound mixer and finishing editor is Zach Goldsboro, and our motion graphics designer is Julie Mullins. Next week, we'll have a brand new episode on James Bond. Thanks, folks. Bye. Bye.